We tell the story in area two of some of the diverse um, places that suffrage leaders looked for support. Um, one of the things that the suffrage movement in the, the t early 20th century especially was very against was capital punish punishment, especially when women were on trial. Uh, women had no jury of their peers. Uh, women were not allowed to serve on juries. They had no voice in the election of judges or lawmakers. And so one of the cases that they really took a stand for was for Roxolana, Roxolana Drews, who was the last person hanged in New York State. Our speaker tonight is Ashley Hopkins Benton, senior historian and curator of social history at the New York State Museum. The title of her lecture tonight is Agitate, Agitate, Collect, Artifacts of Women's Descent. I think you'll find this to be quite interesting. And please welcome Ashley Hopkins Benton. Um, so today I'd like to tell you some of, a little bit about some of the artifacts in the exhibition and the story of our collecting for the Women's March. Um, so the exhibition runs from November 4th through May 13th, uh, 2018, and it's a very different exhibition for us at the State Museum. We don't have a lot of women's history artifacts in our collection yet. It's something that we're working on. And certainly we don't have a lot of artifacts related to this fight for women's rights. So we have reached out across New York State and across the Northeast, and we are working with 45 different lenders, um, both public and private institutions and um, individual collectors to help fill out and tell the story of women's rights in New York State. The ex exhibition is divided into three areas, the first called Agitate, Agitate, and we had a lot of thought about where to start the exhibition because for a lot of people the story of women's rights in New York State and nationally begins in 1848 with Seneca Falls. Uh, but we know that there was so much talking about women's rights, about what rights women should have, uh, starting at the, the beginning after the American Revolution. So we decided to start in 1776. Uh, one of the early stories that we tell is that of Ernestine Rose, who came from Europe, settled in New York, and began an exhaustive travel uh, routine, speaking on the lecture circuit on women's rights. Um, she was concerned with education and especially married women's property rights. When a woman married in the early 19th century, all of her property went to her husband, regardless of what she inherited or what she worked for, and if he squandered all of it, it was gone. She was very concerned with this, and so she and many others in New York State began a series of petition campaigns trying to change the law, and finally in 1848, New York State was the first state in the nation to protect married women's property rights. Um, we think part of that comes from the Dutch heritage in, in New York State. Uh, Dutch women under their law were allowed to own property, um, so it's something that, that remained. We also look at the story of the fight for women's rights within other reform movements that were so active in New York State, um, particularly in the temperance movement and abolition. Um, within these reform movements, they were discussing women's place. Um, did they have the right to speak at conventions? Did they have the right to speak to the public? Um, in the abolition movement, there was the discussion of the propriety of including women in the movement, um, whether they could be involved in meetings. Many women formed their own societies. And by 1840 at the World Anti-Slavery Convention, female delegates were first barred at all from attending, and then were permitted to attend but not to speak. Um, so these discussions were ongoing. In the temperance movement, the idea of the avoidance of strong drink, um, one of the, the things that was touted for it was that it protected women from the injurious effects of drunken husbands. And so many women that later became involved in women's rights early on had a place on the speaking circuit in the temperance movement, including Su Susan B. Anthony and Amelia Bloomer. Um, the story of the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention is, of course, very important uh, for the story of women's rights in New York State. And um, we are fortunate we do have a copy of the report from the convention in the collection of the New York State Library. Um, I will mention the New York State Museum, New York State Library, and New York State Archives are located in the same building. Um, so we work very much in partnership when we put on exhibitions. Um, one of the artifacts that we very much wanted and wished we could have, an artifact that has a really very interesting story, is that of the Declaration of Sentiments table. When Elizabeth Cady Stanton 
um, worked with her friends to decide to hold a women's rights convention in Seneca Falls in 1848. She got together at the home of the McClintocks in Waterloo and worked on writing a declaration that would spell out everything that they were thinking about women's rights. Um, eventually, it would be called the Declaration of Sentiments. It was modeled on the Declaration of Independence, and it began, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. She replaced the colonist grievances with the ways that women were oppressed in the government, in the home, the professions, education, and the church. And she herself added the, the idea of the right to elective franchise as a, cure to, a key to securing other rights. So on the top, you can see the table where she sat down and wrote the Declaration of Sentiments. And it has a very interesting story after 1848. It was passed down from the McClintocks to Susan B. Anthony. After it lived in Rochester in Susan B. Anthony's house, it went on to the suffrage organizations at the time. And after the 19th Amendment was passed, it, went, it was given by the suffrage organization to the Smithsonian. And they pasted a copy of the Declaration of Sentiments to the bottom of it. Uh, one of the interesting things as a curator, though, is we got in contact with the, the um, Smithsonian and said, this is a key artifact. We'd really like to have it. It should come back to New York State for the centennial. And they said, well, we're doing an exhibition on democracy, and it's important there as well. Um, so we will be showing a reproduction table that's from the McClintock House and helping to tell that story that way. Desks are an artifact that show up very frequently in historic homes and museums as a, a men's artifact. Um, but we, have, we found that we actually have a lot of desks and images of women at desks in this exhibition, which I think is an interesting um, strain that runs through. During the 19th century women's rights movement, there was a real focus on words, on speeches, on writing, on newspaper articles. And writing was an important way for women like, Susan, or like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Matilda Joslyn Gage and Martha Coffin Wright to get their words out even while they were taking care of their families. Um, Martha Coffin Wright was seven months pregnant at the Seneca Falls Convention. And she regretted later that she was not able to participate more as she wanted to um, because of her state. Elizabeth Cady Stanton frequently couldn't travel because she was taking care of her many children. Um, and Wright actually wrote, I love Mrs. Stanton for the ardor and energy she shows in advocating for a cause and envy her ability to clothe her thoughts in words that burn. Um, so here we have Elizabeth Cady Stanton's writing desk, which is still in the collection of the Stanton family. And Matilda Joslyn Gage's desk, which um, came directly from her family and um, now frequently is on loan to the Matilda Joslyn Gage house in Fayetteville, New York. While some women were tied to the home and were writing, others were able to travel, Susan B. Anthony in particular. Um, she was unmarried and had the ability to spend exhaustive amounts of time on the road, um, not just in New York State, but also she focused her efforts on other states that were holding referendum. So we are very fortunate for our exhibition that we will be able to have her iconic alligator purse. This was an artifact um, that she was known for. She always traveled with. Um, she also frequently wore a red scarf during her speaking engagements. And that scarf is also in the collection of the Smithsonian. Um, but the alligator purse is a prized artifact at the Susan B. Anthony House in Rochester. Um, we can't have it the whole exhibition. So if you really want to see it and you want to come to Albany to see it, you have to come the first three weeks. Um, but it was so well known that when she was traveling in California, in a newspaper, they actually wrote a rhyme about her carrying it. And, and her, she appears in the, the rhyme, which becomes a schoolyard chant. And you've probably heard it. Uh, it goes, Miss Lulu had a baby. She called him Tiny Tim. She put him in the bathtub to see if he could swim. He drank up all the water. He ate up all the soap. He tried to swallow the bathtub, but it wouldn't go down his throat. Call for the doctor. Call for the nurse. Call for the lady with the alligator purse. Mumps, says the doctor. Measles, says the nurse. Vote, said the lady with the alligator purse. One of the great things about working with multiple lenders and different collections and oftentimes very small institutions that don't really get a chance to talk statewide is some of the connections that we've been able to make between artifacts. Um, so the dress on the left in the collection of the Rochester Historical Society was something that we heard about pretty early on in our research. We were excited to have Susan B. Anthony's dress. Um, it, it, 
clothing is often a, a really great tangible artifact to connect to people, but we didn't have a lot more story with it until we went to the Seneca Falls Historical Society. And we found the photograph here, which shows Anthony wearing that very dress. Uh, and then stories started to come out of the woodwork about how Anthony often dressed in black, except for that red shawl, and how her friends prodded her to pick a different color. And so she went with this, this maroon or purplish dress. Um, We also talk about the story of um, dress reform in the 19th century. Um, popular dress for women in the 19th century was considered to be one of the things holding them back. It was heavy, it was cumbersome, they wore a corset and um, long uh, a chemise underneath and long petticoats. Uh, it was a lot of weight, it was long, it dragged on the ground. And so women in the women's rights movement started to look to some of the other movements um, the Oneida community, the water cure movement, and they saw that they were adopting different modes of dress that involved a shorter skirt and pants underneath. Elizabeth Smith Miller, who was the daughter of reformer Garrett Smith, was credited with actually introducing this idea of the bloomer costume to the women's rights movement, and it was very quickly picked up when Amelia Bloomer published it in her newspaper um, called The Lily. You can see Bloomer wearing her um, set of bloomers in the daguerreotype from the collection of the Seneca Falls Historical Society. And I am very glad to say that the actual bloomer costume will be part of our exhibition. It's from the Cortland Historical Society. It is one of only two full extant examples of bloomer costumes in the country. So we are very um, lucky to have it. Uh, the story of them finding it is very interesting as well. They were called by the bank and told that they had something in the safe deposit box. They had to check it out. It was a trunk. And lo and behold, they pulled out this complete bloomer costume. Um, the best example, I think. Um, this piece comes again from the collection of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's family. Um, it is a carte de visite of Sojourner Truth. Truth was born into slavery in Ulster County, New York, and in 1827 she sought her own freedom. She became involved in both the abolition and women's rights movements and is probably best known in the women's rights circles for her 1851 speech at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention when she talked about the double discrimination faced by African American women. Um, after the war, as arguments raged over African-American Afri suffrage versus women's suffrage first, um, African-American women were really left out, but she remained steadfastly a part of the women's rights movement. And carte de visites like this one were sold by Truth at conventions to support her family. Um, so for us, this is a really great artifact to connect to those people that actually attended these conventions during the 19th century. Um, in 1876, uh, there were celebrations in Philadelphia for the nation's centennial, and the suffrage movement saw this as an opportunity to get the word out. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony had left an earlier group called the American Equal Rights Association, which fought for both African American and women's rights at the same time, to form the National Women's Suffrage Association in 1869. And so at the centennial, they requested an official place on the fairgrounds. They were denied, um, and then finally given a small booth way in the corner in the back where no one would see, uh, and they decided that was not enough. So they rented headquarters across the street, uh, held suffrage meetings, um, put out different information on the streets. Um, this is their autograph book, which all of the leaders of the suffrage movement signed. Um, this first page is signed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Lily Deverell Blake. Um, it's a really interesting connection between the early 19th century leaders and the leaders that would carry the suffrage movement into the 20th century. And um, relates to the story of ultimately at the fair, they made their way to the official presentations. They were denied a place on the program, but in a break of the speeches, they marched up and presented their own de Declaration of Women's Rights to the Vice President. Um, so they, they made themselves heard, even though they were not welcome at this gathering. This is a journal that we stumbled upon accidentally. Um, 
we were giving a talk about some of our research pretty early in our um, planning stages and a librarian approached us and said, we have this journal, are you telling the story of the 1872 election? You need to see it. In 1872, um, at various points during the 19th century, women tried to vote in different locations across the Northeast. Um, but in 1872 in Rochester, there was a larger group of women led by Elizabeth, Susan B. Anthony uh, who attempted to vote. And this journal was kept by the husband of one of these, these women. Um, it was kept by Maurice Leiden, husband of Maggie Leiden. And he records all of the activities around this event, of them trying to register to vote. He says that he thinks they're right and that they should try to vote. And then he talks about the arrest later of Susan B. Anthony and of the officers who let these women vote. Finally, in area one, we tell the story of the women who ran for president before women actually had the right to vote. Um, on the left is Victoria Woodhull. Woodhull came to New York City with her sister Tennessee in 1868, rapidly befriended Vanderbilt, and set up a stock brokerage, the first run by women in the United States. She announced her candidacy for president in April of 1870 and um, had a very interesting platform that included the idea of free love and women's rights to their own bodies. Uh, she came out of a very bad marriage to an alcoholic uh, who left her unsupported with two children. So those were causes that were very near and dear to her heart. Um, but she also spoke out against the sexual double standard and in doing so got a lot of negative attention in the press, um, thus ruining her campaign. After her, the second woman to run for president of the United States, also a New Yorker, was Belva Lockwood from Brailton, New York, outside of Niagara Falls. Um, she was first a teacher who saw wage inequality firsthand. She then decided that education was going to be the key to her betterment, and so she went to college and then law school. She had to um, talk to the President of the United States in order to actually get her degree from law school, even after she completed all of her coursework and was the first woman to serve on um, the Supreme, to be admitted to the bar to serve before the Supreme Court. Um, so she ran for president in both 1884 and 1888. And in 1884, she earned 4,149 votes, um, losing to Grover Cleveland, but a, a very substantial number. And there were reports of many votes for her being dumped during the campaign. So the second area of our exhibition starts in 1890, and that is when the two national suffrage organizations that were formed after the Civil War merged um, again. And very important in this story for us is the story of the New York State Women's Suffrage Association, uh, which was organized in 18, back in 1869. It was formed as an umbrella organization for the small political equality clubs and suffrage clubs across the state. And it actually was the largest membership of any statewide organization for suffrage um, and give it, gave the largest amount of money to the national organizations each year. Um, so in the exhibit, we feature a lot of ribbons um, like these that were used at conventions, featuring leaders in both the national and state movement. As we roll into the, the 20th century, um, a big part of the charge for women's suffrage comes from what are called political equality clubs or suffrage clubs. Women began to have more free time, more leisure, as um, more technology was helping make their, their work lives less and less in the house. And so they began organizing into clubs. Um, and clubs were a place where they could develop organizational skills, work on public speaking, and um, generally learn from each other. In 1910, um, the city of Binghamton developed a political equality club with 12 members. Meanwhile, in Geneva, New York, there were 400 members. Um, so they, they ranged wildly in size. Um, and as I said, they fell under the umbrella of the New York State Women's Suffrage Association. And in this slide, I show a political equality club scrapbook from Clinton, New York. As we did our research, we came across these scrapbooks all over the place. Um, just about every town that had its own political equality club had some kind of scrapbook documenting the things that they were doing, the speakers they were bringing in, um, the ways they were organizing. This is a spoon from the Rochester a political Equality Club. They also had a very strong presence, of course, in the home of Susan B. Anthony. Um, that 
that is not surprising. Um, and you can see the spoon mold that was used for creating these souvenir spoons that were a fundraiser. In the story of women's rights, we have a lot of families that were involved, um, different generations that became involved in the fight for suffrage. Here we have Elizabeth Smith Miller and her da daughter Anne Fitzhugh Miller. I mentioned Elizabeth already. She was the one who introduced the bloomer costume to women's rights. Um, she was the daughter of Garrett Smith, a famous abolitionist in New York State, um, and there was really just reform in this family's blood. Both mother and daughter were actively involved in the New York State Women's Suffrage Association and helped the organization host conventions in Geneva in 1897 and 1907. And they were responsible for establishing the Gene Geneva Political Equality Club in 1897. This image shows the Cayuga County Suffrage Headquarters. And um, if you look very closely at the posters, um, you'll see these again in the next slides. Um, in Cayuga County, Elizabeth Howland was one of the major organizers, and her family also ran a store um, just outside of uh, Aurora, and they also traveled the world and began collections. So ultimately, their store and their cabinet of curiosities, their collections, and their suffrage artifacts became part of a museum, which is now called the Helen Stone Store Museum. And it is probably the biggest, most intact suffrage collection that we encountered during our research. Um, so you can see posters that actually appeared in that photograph. These two are very interesting because New York State had two major suffrage referendum, one in 1915 and one in 1917, and these two posters were reused. If you look carefully at the seven, you can see that those are patches over the fives. And these are some other artifacts from Howland. We tell the story in area two of some of the diverse um, places that suffrage leaders looked for support. Um, one of the things that the suffrage movement in the, the t early 20th century especially was very against was capital punish punishment, especially when women were on trial. Uh, women had no jury of their peers. Uh, women were not allowed to serve on juries. They had no voice in the election of judges or lawmakers. And so one of the cases that they really took a stand for was for Roxolana, Roxolana Drews, who was the last person hanged in New York State. Um, her neighbors claim that she was in an abusive relationship. Others later claim that she refused to be an obedient wife. Um, but she killed her husband with the help of her daughter and nephew and was arrested. Her case went to the governor of New York, David B. Hill, who held it up for a long time. He received hundreds and hundreds of letters and petitions arguing both that she should be executioned and she shouldn't. Um, but ultimately, she was hung on February 28, 1887 and the hanging was botched. Um, so the suffragists took again to this matter and pushed for a change in the law um, so that New York State moved to using electrocution instead of hanging. Um, and the um, gallows weight is in our collection at the New York State Museum. The New York State Archives has a wonderful collection of letters related to this case, um, of the ones that were written to the governor in her behalf. We also tell the story of the new woman. Um, in the, at the turn of the century, as more and more women were working outside of the home than ever before, they had access to college and the professions, and they felt that they were equal to, to men. Um, so they, they sought the were seeking the vote because they felt their equality. And this is just a, a great collection that we found um, amongst our collections related to Mildred Clark Pryor, who in 1923 decided to bob her hair. She got the permission of her husband and her father first, um, but she was interested in making that change. Um, we also tell the story of the visiting nurses in New York City, and one of the things that the 20th century suffrage movement really took on was communication with the immigrant community. Um, the Henry Street Settlement was founded by Lillian Wald in 1893 and it was located in the immigrant communities of New York City. Um, the visiting nurses not only provided home health care, but they also gave out information about the suffrage movement and, and really talked it up. The bag that we have is from the Schenectady Visiting Nurses, um, which was founded in 1919. The labor movement is also a very important part of the 20th century story. Uh, in September of 1909, there was a large strike of two garment factories in New York City. 
And then in 1911, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which killed 146 mostly immigrant women. And between those two um, major events, the suffrage movement saw that this was a place that they needed to work, um, that women who had the vote could help choose legislators who would improve working conditions for working women. Um, the sewing machine that you see here is actually in the collection of the New York State Department of Labor. It comes from the Triangle Shirtwaist Company and was collected as evidence after the fire. Finally, our prized suffrage artifact at the New York State Museum is our suffrage wagon. Um, this wagon in 1913 was covered in suffrage signs, including one that read, if taxation without representation was tyranny in 1776, why not 1913? And it was used in parades and as a speaker's platform. Uh, as we rolled into the 20th century, women sought more public ways to get the message out about suffrage through parades, through public meetings, and um, through kind of media stunts like this one. Um, they also held suffrage hikes. In December of 1912, 26 women departed New York City to march to Albany to deliver a message to Governor-elect William Solzer. They were led by General Rosalie Jones, who is seen on the left, and their goal was to gain support in some of the rural towns that they were marching through. It took them 13 days total, and their marchers included Sybil Wilbur, an investigative journalist from Boston. Solzer remarked when they got there, all my life I have believed in the right of women to exercise the franchise with men as a matter of justice. I will do what I can to advance their rights. The artifact, uh, the exhibition also features a number of artifacts um, related to the merchandising of suffrage. Women um, took advantage of this way to get their suffrage message out onto the streets and into people's homes through a, a broad variety of artifacts. And we tell the story of several women artists involved in the suffrage movement. Um, these works are by Lila Usher. She was commissioned by the um, National Association, National Women's Suffrage Association um, to create this medallion of Susan B. Anthony. And this was another discovery in our collection. Um, we knew we had a collection of Lila Usher sculptures. The medallion that you see on the left was cataloged as Old Woman with a Bun. And so while we were doing research and we found out that she did the Susan B. Anthony medallion, we went to take a closer look at it, and indeed it is Anthony. We also feature the work of Alice Morgan Wright, a sculptor from Albany who studied in New York City and then went to Paris in 1909 to continue her studies. Wright became in, interested in the British suffrage movement, um, became friends with Emmeline Pankhurst, and eventually was arrested for her uh, involvement in a demonstration in England and sent to Holloway Prison. Um, the brooch on the bottom left is the one that she received after being released from prison. Um, the sculpture on the lower right is called The Fist, and she created that after the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1921 in celebration. As I mentioned earlier, New York State had two major suffrage referendums in 1915 and 1917. So we have a lot of artifacts that speak specifically to these referendum. Um, on the right is a paper cup, again, a way to get their message out to many people on the street. Um, in 1915, there were referendums not only in New York, but in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. And these were all states with large populations. Um, so they believed that if one fell, the whole nation would then follow. Um, unfortunately, it took until 1917 for New York State to pass suffrage. And of course, we do have to tell the anti-suffrage story. Um, there were many men and women who were fighting against suffrage for a variety of reasons, um, but their story is, of course, important as well. I did want to show you the original um, poster from the New York State Library collection that is the basis for the graphic that you saw at the beginning that we're using both as the intro to our exhibition and as the cover of our exhibition catalog. The third area, um, we realized that women's rights, the fight for women's rights didn't end in 1920, so we needed to continue the story. 
Uh, we talk about the ERA, um, and there's a lot of connections to history, starting in this third section, where women were still fighting for rights, but they were looking back at the past and looking at the women who came before them. So in 1923, Alice Paul, leader of the National Women's Party, realized that suffrage didn't end equality, and she made an announcement um, of legislation called the Equal Rights Amendment to a group in Seneca, Seneca Falls during the 70, 75th anniversary celebrations. And this photo of her on the left is her at Susan B. Anthony's gravestone before she made that announcement. On the right is a bracelet um, that uh, comes from the 1980s. There was a woman who was collecting state charms for each state that ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. And of course, it was never ratified. This is a collection that we acquired as um, part of the process of putting on this exhibition on women's suffrage. This, it, these are artifacts from the second congressional union. The first congressional union was a suffrage organization. The second was formed in 1980 to um, support the ERA and to push for its ratification across the nation. And they very much looked to the past for symbolism for their protests. They protested on Susan B. Anthony's birthday, on the dates of major suffrage anniversaries, and they recreated um, things like the silent sentinels in front of the White House, or the burning of effigies in front of the White House. Uh, they were very much tied into the history of suffrage. We also tell the story of women's um, political pioneers from New York State, um, specifically focusing on Shirley Chisholm, who in 1968 was the first African American woman elected to the US Congress, and then in 1972 ran for president. She said, um, as a black person, I am no stranger to race prejudice. But the truth is that in the political world, I have been far oftener discriminated against because I'm a woman than because I am black. Prejudice against women is still acceptable. Um, we also feature Bella Abzug, who was elected to Congress in 1971, and we focus on the story of her fight for the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which was passed in 1974, allowing women to apply for their own credit cards or their own mortgages, um, something that they previously needed their husband's permission for. We talk about the story of birth control and of the activist Margaret Sanger. I absolutely love this artifact. Um, it is a hooked rug, and it reads, Cupid, sir, please sheathe your arrow. I do not wish to act so rude, but please regard my present brood. And we love it because it tells the story of the very early birth control movement, where women were struggling with large families. They wanted to, to be able to just have the children that they could actually take care of. Um, and they were really seeking out information. Um, so that was very much Margaret Sanger's focus in the beginning. In 1977, um, Congress announced the Year of the Woman and announced a national conference in Houston, which was preceded by state and territory meetings in all of the states, um, including the state meeting in Albany, New York. And you can, in the photo, you can see the state museum in the background. Um, so we like this photo. Um, this was a way to kind of discuss what rights women were really pushing for at that time, to discuss the, the Equal Rights Amendment, what to do to get it passed, and also other important um, important issues of the day. One of the leaders of New York's movement and one of the honorary chairs of the national movement was Mary Ann Krupsack, the first female lieutenant governor of New York State. And finally, we talk about memory and preservation. Um, the idea of memory being a tool for fighting for women's rights really began in the 19th century when Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Matilda Joslyn Gage began work on the history of women's suffrage, which ultimately became six volumes. Um, and it was very much both about preservation and it was political. Um, here we have pictures of the Wesleyan Chapel where the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention was held. Um, and over the years, it was buried in a variety of things that didn't speak to its past at all. It was a laundromat. It was a car dealership. Um, in 1923, Alice Paul came to announce the ERA, but you couldn't tell that the, the Wesleyan Chapel was what it was. In 1932, they placed a New York State historic marker, but it wasn't until 1982 that the Women's Rights National Historic Park was opened in Seneca Falls to commemorate that event.
And so our exhibit really has turned to connecting the present to the past. Um, again, we have the image of Alice Paul at Susan B. Anthony's grave and an image from the election last year of women going and placing their I Voted stickers on Susan B. Anthony's gravestone as well. We talk a little bit about modern preservation efforts uh, in Central Park in New York City. There are currently no statues of real women. Uh, so there is an effort underway to raise money and to create a sculpture. And um, there's a lot of really interesting diverse groups that are working on this fundraising effort. Students and Girl Scouts. Um, so it's, it's an interesting community effort that we've been working on documenting. And then there comes the women's women's march. Um, I participated, as you can see, and while I was there, I couldn't help but thinking of these women that had fought for women's rights in New York State and what was happening today um, and making those connections. So we decided that we did need to connect. And um, it's hard to collect from things that are going on and that are so current. Um, so we had a lot of conversations in the museum about themes that we could look at and how we could kind of focus our efforts. Um, one of them was connecting the present to the past. And we ended up collecting a lot of signs that really harken back to the suffrage movement, that harken back to the fight against fascism, um, all these different ties to people's past in New York State. I will also add, we collected artifacts from women from New York State who marched in Washington, D.C., and then artifacts that were used in marches in New York State. So that was kind of our, our first focus. Um, we collected a lot of artifacts that specifically connected to the sites of these marches. So at Walkway over the Hudson in Poughkeepsie, there were a lot of images talking about um, building bridges instead of walls and showing images of the bridge where the march took place. In Albany, we saw depictions of the Empire State Plaza and of the egg, this really iconic architecture of Albany. We also looked at creators. Um, this is from a graphic designer um, who really wanted to be able to produce something that people could print and um, get out and take with them to different marches. She herself marched in Washington, D.C. She sent other pieces with people to Poughkeepsie and all over New York State. And we also collected from artists. Um, on the left is a drawing by Mary Andico, um, who printed her original pen and ink drawing and sent it with a friend to Washington. And then it was signed by all of her fellow marchers. On the right, uh, an original watercolor that was printed and then carried by Sheila Troutman in a march in New York State. And we wanted to tell the story not just of the women that marched, but of the men that marched. Um, because during the suffrage movement, the support of men was very important for getting suffrage passed. They were the ones that had to vote. Um, so too, again, it was important that there were male supporters. Um, and what is interesting about this collection is we were originally approached by the husband. It was a husband and wife who marched together. He wore the hat and the patch. But the patch on the upper right also is that connection to previous history. Um, the marcher, who is in her early 30s, I believe, um, got on the subway. She had that patch on. She was seen by a woman in her late 70s who said, look, and turned around. And she had the same phrase written on her back. And she was someone that had marched in Washington in the 60s and 70s, um, still working for equal rights. We also focused on necessary accessories for the um, women's march. So women were encouraged to carry clear plastic bags. And of course, there is the ubiquitous pussy hat. Um, we have both knitted and sewn examples, which I think is really interesting. We have a lot of artifacts that came from families who marched with their children. Um, who t and one of the things that we did as we collected these artifacts was for each donor, we asked them a series of questions. Where did you march? Who did you march with? Why did you march? What was your most important memory? Um, so the stories of those children and, and what they thought of going to the march with their families is, is probably one of the most interesting parts of the collection. And I will leave you with one of those stories, um, probably my favorite. Um, the young woman on the right, on the, the lower left-hand side, is named Alethea. And she wrote us a fabulous statement. Um, she was a junior in high school at the time. 
She's she starting her senior, senior year. She had entirely different intentions on what her college experience was going to be, but she wrote, I felt very helpless through the election because I'm too young to vote, but being at the march showed me that resisting and practicing my rights to assemble and protest are just as important. The sun was setting, the crowd was full of protesters and pink pussy hats, and even though this meant the day was ending, it felt like it was just beginning. It was so important for me to be there. Walking back to my car after being awake for over 24 hours, I never felt more awake, more strong. This day changed the way I saw myself. I always knew that I was outspoken, but I now knew more than ever that I was the strong woman that I was raised to be. And she is now um, seeking a career in social justice. So um, a really wonderful story of, of how this experience completely changed her life. And in turn, it also changed our focus for our education plans. Um, so that now the educators in the museum are working on a series of education plans that look at the past, at the suffrage artifacts that you saw in the beginning of the presentation, and work on connecting students who don't have that political voice. They can't vote yet. Um, but to get them to think about how they can be active and engaged in their own communities. So a, a really interesting close to the circle. And I thank you. Hi, um, I was wondering what was your favorite artifact that you've come across? Uh, my favorite artifact? Um, definitely the hooked rug is, is high on my list um, because it's such a personal artifact that one woman created and it packs such a punch in its me message but it's also such an unassuming artifact on, a, on its surface so I think that would be my choice. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on how suffrage collections in different museums sort of get collected and get curated um, and the reason I'm asking this is I know the Suffragette Fellowship Collection in the Museum of London in the UK was sort of very consciously curated by the suffragettes themselves, and I wondered if something similar ever happened here. Hmm. Um, I think a lot of the artifacts in the institutions that we borrowed from do, did land there because of the suffragists themselves. The Smithsonian Collection is, is probably the best example of that, um, the Declaration of Sentiments table getting there directly from the National Suffrage Association and them saying, we really need our story told in the National Museum. Um, so that, that got there that way. But we looked at so many other collections where, the, uh, as I said, the scrapbooks, the political equality clubs that were active in each town um, very specifically saved their artifacts, saved um, articles and announcements, and made sure that those made them into the local historical societies. And a lot of them were the founding members of this, those historical societies. Excellent presentation, thank you. I was struck by the uh, mention about women's, uh, married women's property rights and the Dutch heritage. Mm -hmm. And it also sparked a question in my mind. I know that uh, New York State had a number of Shaker communities. Did the Shaker um, communities have any influence on uh, how women were seen as in terms of equality? I don't know that there is as much influence from the Shaker communities. Um, <sighs> as much as we see from the other reform movements, honestly. And again, thank you very much, Ashley, for a really interesting presentation.